So if you're a standard level student and you chose option E, astrophysics, then I'm going to go over those different equations for you. Remember, these are the ones for the standard level and higher level, of course. And if you're higher level, then you also have these extra ones here. But let's maybe uh, take a quick little look here and we'll maybe start with the first ones here. So both of these equations right here have to do with black bodies. So what a black body is, that's something that is a perfect absorber or emitter of radiation. Now this one right here is actually known as the Stefan Boltzmann's Law. And the second one right here, this is to do, well, this is sometimes called the Wien's Displacement Law. So both of these have to do with an effective temperature. And if you remember about uh, black bodies, you can take a look at the fact that, let's say we have... Um, a graph of intensity of some type versus wavelength and a black body will tend to have you know a curve that goes something like this this is something with a certain temperature and this right here this dotted line that represents this lambda max you know this maximum wavelength here but if something is hotter for example let's say it's uh, it's even hotter then maybe its curve will go like this so this time it'll be taller, but it also tells you that its maximum wavelength will also be different. So it turns out by knowing where your maximum wavelength is, that corresponds to a temperature. So this right here will be maybe hot, whereas this other one over here, that might be, this black one right here, that might be cooler. So it turns out a temperature corresponds to a maximum wavelength. So I don't really think I have to define these because lambda max, that's the maximum wavelength in meters and T is the associated temperature that it matches in Kelvin. So this one right here, this equation right here, Wien's displacement law, matches these things right here where that's the maximum wavelength that you get. Now this one, the Stefan Boltzmann's law, that one um, is related to, well, L is the luminosity of a star. Now luminosity is a unit of power, so it's measured in watts but it's also measured in joules per second. Because again, don't forget about that most important equation to memorize from topic two. Uh, I'll show it to you. This one right here, that power is energy over time. So that means instead of watts, we can also say joules per second. So this is what's happening in a star. A star has an intrinsic property to it. It's called luminosity. That tells you really like how bright it really is, you know, because not all stars are equally bright. Some are really dim stars, some are really bright. And that's an intrinsic property of the stars themselves. Now, T is still the effective temperature. So T is the temperature. We normally measure it in Kelvin. And A, that is actually the surface area of a sphere. So in this case, it's 4 pi r squared. So this talks about how, again, the light from the star is spread out over a big spherical area, and that means that you have to consider the surface area of that sphere. Now, sigma, that is just a constant. And actually, this is essentially, this is the same equation you had in topic 8, by the way. If you look at topic 8, which is, where is that? That's here. Topic 8 had that the power was equal to sigma times a t to the fourth. That was the power um, that the sun, for example, puts out. So power is sigma at to the fourth. And if you look at this one, this is luminosity is sigma at to the fourth. That's because luminosity is the fancy word we have in astrophysics to tell us about the power of a star. And no surprise, it's got units of power, right? Watts. So hopefully this all makes sense. You can always look up what sigma is by going to page two, I think it is, of your data booklet, at least the second page that has information in it. And you get sigma right here, the Stefan Boltzmann's constant, 5.67 times 10 to the minus eight. That's this one. Now if we go back, so those are things with black bodies. That's what these right here represented. Now these ones, however, these are all going to be for distances to stars. Okay, so we can find the distance using, well, lots of different ways. These are the three ways that are at least here. There's another method that we talk about called um, C-feed variables that doesn't show up here. But here are at least the three methods. So this first one right here, this is called the parallax method. Now the good news is, I don't think I have to write this down because D is the distance to the star measured in units called parsecs. 
and P is the parallax angle, and that's an arc second. Actually, maybe I will say that, just uh, at least to define those. So D is the distance in parsec. That's this one right here. And P is the parallax angle, which is measured in arc seconds. Now remember what an arc second is? It's just because these are here are such small, tiny, little, ridiculously small angles that we measure. Remember, a parallax uh, is all about this thing right here. So when we have, let's say, we have the sun, and then we have the Earth that's orbiting around the sun. And then if we take a picture of a star, you know, on a certain date, let's say, and then we take the same picture of the same star, but six months later, which means we've gone around, you know, halfway across our orbit. So we might see the star appear here, then we see the star appear here depending on when we took the picture. Well, this here is the parallax angle, and this distance right here, that's D. Okay, so this is the distance in parsecs, and this is the parallax angle, and the thing is, the angle is so small. I mean, you'd expect it to be in degrees, but it turns out one degree is not, it's way too big. So we need something much smaller than that. So if you take a degree and split it up into 60 equal units, that's called minutes of arc. And then if you split up each minute into 60 seconds of arc, then that's what one arc second is. Which really means that one arc second is one 3,600th of a degree. So that's really small. And the reason why we call this parsec is because we have a parallax angle of one second. That's how it's defined. So if we set, you know, what distance here corresponds to an angle of exactly one arc second, you know, if I make P one arc second, then I have a certain distance, and that distance is defined as one parsec. So we write PC for short. So this is the method called parallax. Now we have another method for finding distances. This one right here is actually called, so I'll just put a little thing like this, and I'll make it uh, maybe, so this is called spectroscopic parallax. Now the idea is this that if something is a certain distance away, then no matter how bright it really is, it'll look dimmer because it's further away. So in that sense then, for spectroscopic parallax, uh, maybe I'll just do this over here then. So we've got spectroscopic parallax. Well, we've got B, that's the apparent brightness of a star. So this we can measure on Earth. This is easy to measure. So the apparent brightness is, well, we'll look at the units of it in a second. L is still the luminosity of the star. Whoops, I have to learn how to spell here. So luminosity. It's okay to make spelling mistakes as long as you catch it. So luminosity of the star. That'll be measured in, well, luminosity is a measure of power. So it's going to be in watts. And D is the distance to the star. But this time, keep in mind, this distance here was measured in parsecs. This one, however, distance to the star, is going to be measured in meters. So this is really important here, that it's actually in meters. So what happens then is, well, let's say you have two equally bright stars. So two stars that are actually the same real brightness. If I took those two stars and had them the same distance away, then they would have the same apparent brightness. But what if those two same brightness stars here, in other words, same luminosity of the star, were placed at a different distance away? What this equation does, it tells you that, oh, well, depending on how bright it really is, um, you know, depending on how far away it is, it tells you how bright it will appear on Earth. So apparent brightness, this is what we measure on Earth, and it's really easy to measure. And that's because we just look at the power over the surface area. So in this case right here it would be, well, luminosity over distance squared, so that would have units of watts per meters squared. So that would be the units of apparent brightness. It's how many watts you measure for every meter squared. So what you do is, this is really easy to measure on Earth. You just have a detector that sits on the ground, and you have the light from the star running into that detector, and then you just measure the power on that detector for every square meter of that detector's size. That's apparent brightness. That's easy. The hard thing, however, is to get the distance. And so what you do, uh, this is now, you could use the parallax method, but the problem is it only works for things that are 100 parsecs or so 
uh, or closer. Anything further away, we can't tell this tiny little difference in parallax angle. We won't really notice it. So because of that, then, um, this is limited to only things of around 100 parsecs or less. So if you want things that are further away, then you have to use this method here or other methods. So spectroscopic parallax, the reason why we call it this, is because the luminosity is hard to know. You can't actually tell the luminosity unless you go to that star uh, or go near it. So what you can do then, while you measure the apparent brightness, you want to know the distance, so you want to calculate that, so you take an educated guess about the luminosity. Now how do we actually take a guess on luminosity? Well, we use the HR diagram. So the HR diagram, that'll have the luminosity or the absolute magnitude on this scale. And over here, this will be something related to the wavelength. It turns out most stars sit on this sort of thing right here we call the main sequence. So what we can then do is say, okay, well, if, now the reason why I call it spectroscopic parallax is because what we do is we measure the apparent brightness of a star. Now we want the distance, but that means we have to guess luminosity. So what we do is we use this well-known graph. Now this has been done for lots of stars where we did know the distance. So if we know the distance, that means we can know the luminosity. So if you do this graph for well-known things with well-known distances, you can actually match their luminosities and their wavelengths. Remember, that wavelength has to do with this right here, their maximum wavelength. So if you take the light from the star and split it up into its spectrum, that's why we call it spectroscopic, by looking at its maximum wavelength, let's say it's something that's right here. This is its maximum wavelength, whatever that wavelength represents. Let's say it's yellowish. This is like our own sun. Well, if it matches up with this one, and it's an unknown distance though, what you do is you match that up, you go up here, you know, and say, oh, it's a main sequence star, so that means it has a luminosity of pretty much this value, whatever that luminosity is. And if you know that luminosity, then you can calculate the distance. So you see how you sort of guess at the luminosity, but it's not a wild guess, it's an educated guess, because we use this HR diagram. That's why it's called spectroscopic parallax. Now this last method right here, this is, maybe we'll do this in red. This method right here, that's called magnitudes. So this method is kind of a, it's an old fashioned one. So we have little m, that's the apparent magnitude of a star. So this is, by the way, this uses the same physics as what this one does. It turns out this one, this spectroscopic parallax, and the physics behind magnitudes, it's exactly the same, even though they look like totally different equations. So this apparent magnitude is just a different scale. So instead of measuring apparent brightness, we have this arbitrary scale here that has no units. And we just say, okay, well, zero is something really bright, but it's actually kind of a dumb scale because it's backwards. What I mean by that is that something with a large apparent magnitude, let's say like, um, m equals, let's say, 5 is actually dim, where m equals 0 is actually very bright. So it works opposite to what you'd think. And it turns out you can have something even brighter than 0. It turns out you can have a negative apparent magnitude. But apparent just means what we see on Earth. So this is similar to the apparent brightness. In other words, apparent magnitude, you can measure that on Earth easily. Now, capital M, that's the absolute magnitude. That turns out it's defined as what the apparent magnitude would be if you place that star at a certain distance. And it turns out, let's talk about the distance here. So D, that's the distance to the star. But this one is measured in parsecs. So keep that in mind that the different distance methods, this one's in meters, this one is in parsecs, and this one is in parsecs because they tell you that. So what we do is, well, if the distance to the star was exactly 10 parsecs, let's just say we set the distance to be 10. 10 over 10 would be 1, and this is log. I don't know why they wrote LG. It's supposed to be a logarithm, because it's a logarithmic scale. So if we take the log of 1, it turns out that gives you 0. That means m minus m equals 0. That means you can move this big M over to the right, and you have little m equals big M. That's why, by definition, the absolute magnitude is defined as the what the apparent magnitude would be 
if you place that same star at a distance of 10 parsecs away. Now this method right here, I don't really like it very much just because it brings in, I think, a lot of confusion stuff uh, with students, at least with logarithms, especially since this isn't written as L-O-G, it's written as L-G. But this just tells you it's a logarithmic scale. So that's about it. So both of these ways right here actually use the same physics involved. It's just that they have different scales. This one is really easy to measure. Apparent brightness is simple, just like the apparent magnitude is measurable here on Earth. This luminosity, that's an intrinsic property of the star, it tells you how bright the star really is, just like capital M tells you something about that. It tells you what the brightness, or well, how bright the star would appear, or what the apparent magnitude would be, if you placed it at a distance of 10 parsecs away. And D is just your distance to the star in parsecs. So that is everything you need for the standard level portion of option E, which is called astrophysics. So I hope that was helpful to you.